Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming to our panel discussion. Today, we'd like to talk about access, equity, and inclusion relative to broadband expansion. Uh, I'm glad to be here talking with Mountain Connect. I've spoken before the conference in the past, and I've learned a lot about what I know about broadband expansion uh, from Mountain Connect. And I've been working on it for a few years now. And one of the things that I've been coming to is that in some places, people don't have internet access because they, it is not there in that community. In other places, people don't have it because of other navigation or digital skills issues that are not related to that. So we're gonna talk about that today. The other two people on the panel <clears throat> are Angela Seifer from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and Kalim Musa, a co-founder with me of Black Tech Columbus and of the Columbus Rising Project. I'm gonna ask both of them to introduce themselves and talk a bit about their organizations and then we're gonna have this conversation. So Angela, let's start with you. Hi Doug, thanks for having me. Uh, Angela Seifer, I'm the Executive Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and it is super fun to be on an all Columbus panel at Mountain Connect, uh, and sad that we're not in Colorado right now. Uh, I would like to uh, add a reason why folks don't have internet at home to what Doug just said, which is cost. So it's expensive in the United States. So that is actually the biggest barrier to having internet at home, is that it might be there, but you can't afford it. So NDIA is about six years old. We got started because there wasn't an entity representing digital inclusion programs around the country. So we represent community-based organizations, housing authorities, local governments, libraries, and others who are working on equitable access to the internet, which means affordable home broadband, the right device for the tool, and digital literacy. We are a peer-to-peer -peer network. We help folks talk to each other, but at the same time, we learn from what's going on on the ground, and we do advocacy work based upon what's happening locally. Thanks, Angela. And uh, since you're so close to me and we're both in the Columbus area, I often forget that this is a national network and we're just happen to be lucky to have you sitting right here close to us. But you do have that reach and uh, especially in Washington and, and in some governments uh, who consult and, and really when they have a question about something, often you're able to give that answer, which is a, a wonderful way to have some leverage. Also would like to introduce Kalim Musa. Uh, Kaleem, can you tell us a bit about yourself and uh, your organizations? Yeah, so um, hi everyone. Hi Angela, nice to meet you. Uh, Kaleem here representing Black Tech 614, um, as well as the Columbus Rising Project under Rising Communities. Um, Black Tech 614 is basically an organization that is built on building community around Black technologists. Um, we noticed that there was a void in, specifically in our city, um, and we set out to correct that by just providing support, resources, access, and really coming together to address the unique issues that come with being a technologist of color. Um, and so Doug and I and a, and a group of others set out to you know, build something that would address that. Uh, Columbus Rising Project is about access, it's about equity. Um, Doug and I had an idea that <laughs> everyone should be able to access the internet. Um, and <laughs> uh, as well as not just access the internet, but there should be a, a, an IT department for communities um, there where people can go and get their questions answered, where people can go and check out devices, learn about security, learn about privacy, learn about uh, data ownership and begin to progress through a series of activities and trainings that will allow them to become basically literate um, in the digital space. So that's what I represent here today. Um, I am excited to actually sit on this panel. Um, one thing that actually sparked my passion was going to um, an NDIA session. Uh, and, and I might even been sitting in for you, Doug, I don't, I don't recall, but I was invited and that's when I you know, really learned about one, there's so many people working in this space and I love the fact that digital and the digital and the words equity were combined together to just say, you know, this is a, an equity piece, right? This is a, a justice piece so that people who, who don't have access can now have access and they need to be able to have access to navigate. So glad to be here, glad to learn. 
um, very new into this space, but come from a background of a lot of community development, a lot of youth advocacy, and uh, working in startup and technology. So it's really a, a great place to merge all of those interests and passions and really just sincerely trying to help people um, navigate because um, so many folks are marginalized right now and will be even more marginalized as data, AI, you know, 5G, all of these things that uh, could be beneficial, but leaving a lot of people out of the discussion. So glad to be here. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and I'll introduce myself uh, also. So I am Doug McCullough. I'm the Chief Information Officer with the City of Dublin, Ohio. And I come to this through a lot of experience in the City of Dublin, trying to not only manage the technology of that enterprise and its operations and benefits, but the surrounding community. If you don't know Dublin, Ohio, I can tell you it's a community of about 50,000 residents that maybe 20 some years ago invested in a fiber optics network as an economics, economic development play. And it has paid off. Uh, the residents of Dublin, Ohio, although they don't use that internet uh, uh, access, uh, do enjoy uh, good access to the internet in part because of the economic development that has happened in that part of our region, thanks to the presence of a strong and robust uh, internet infrastructure. Uh, I've learned from that quite a bit and uh, I am a black technology professional and I have found that uh, our community in central Ohio was lacking. So that's part of my purpose for helping to co-found uh, Black Tech Columbus. Um, there are a lot of resources and networks of people that are not engaged in, in the game. They're not advocates. They are not doing as much as perhaps some of the rest of us are uh, because they're just working. They're in the cube farm and they are coding or doing database or uh, artificial intelligence or, or data science or, or they are installing networks and they're doing those kinds of things. Uh, but it's incumbent upon us to take a few steps back as the professionals in this industry and ask ourselves questions about, uh, I may know some things and have some special knowledge that can benefit the larger questions that are out there. So I, I co-founded Black Tech Columbus to give uh, Black technology professionals a space in which to uh, connect with each other and collaborate on projects and maybe start some companies and do certain things like that. It has been working out really great. I'm also active with the Intelligent Community Forum. We started out doing some uh, smart city things and the global summit for the Intelligent Community Forum was in Dublin, Ohio this year. And between smart cities activities and intelligent community activities, uh, I have learned a great deal and been able to observe communities around this country and around the world and how they invest in their people. And I began to see many of the communities that are not experiencing a strong uh, digital experience uh, and, and trying to figure out what is the deficit here? How did we get here? Uh, and I know where, why that is, and I think we all know why that is. Some of these uh, gaps and divides are the same uh, in many of the same communities. I'll include rural communities in that as well. But the digital divide is occurring in the same place where the homework gap is occurring, in the same place as where the wage gap is occurring, and many other gaps and divides. However, I believe that the digital divide in particular can take an active role in addressing many of the other gaps and divides. So that if you take people who are experiencing a food desert and you eliminate that food desert, you might not eliminate the wage gap or the wealth gap or the homework gap. But if you give people access to the internet, digital tools, technologies, and, and the wealth of information, then you might impact the homework gap. You might impact job availability. You might impact wages and those kinds of things. So we, we feel like it needs to be one of the first things that is addressed. And that's why we're pouring attention in to uh, what we've called the Columbus Rising Project. And I hope we'll talk about that in another moment. But I just wanted to introduce myself and coming from Dublin, Ohio. If you don't know Ohio, all of central Ohio is just this amazing region uh, with wonderful towns and a lot of diversity. 
and a lot of very smart people, incredible companies and startups and resources and, and, and capital for startups and all sorts of wonderful things. And so it really, really breaks your heart that anyone in this community should do without. Um, the, the economy is being experienced in different ways by different people in different streets and zip codes and area codes. And so uh, we need to address that. And we believe that broadband is one way. However, uh, I'm gonna put this question out to both of you as a panel. I believe that if there's broadband close by or even you have access to broadband, but you don't know you have access or know how to access it, then in fact, you don't have access to broadband. I realize it's a bit of a mind game there, but Angela, let me ask you first, um, you must be experiencing communities that someone is saying, you know, you have access to this, even if it were affordable. Um, but the experiences that people are having uh, put the lie to that. What, what can you tell us about that? We've been trying not to use the word access. It's really hard. I, I continuously still use it because I'm so used to using it, but we've actually been trying not to use it because really it's about availability and adoption. And so when we use the word access, you might mean availability or you might mean adoption. And so what we want everyone to get at is that we need availability and we need adoption. <laughs> So we can't, in the United States, we've really just focused on availability. We haven't focused on adoption. All of our federal funding, where is it going? Availability. It's not going to adoption, but we need it to go to adoption because just because you build it, they may not come. And we know it's such a valuable tool that we have to get at the adoption of it, which means when we're looking at data, we need to look at adoption numbers, not just availability numbers. When we're looking at solutions, we need to look at affordability and digital literacy skills, not just build a network. So in order to get, in order to make that real, we have to look at the, the data, we have to look at what the barriers are, and then we need to look at the solutions to all the barriers, not just availability. So whenever I talk to you, I learn things and, and you're, you help me keep up to speed as to a way of thinking of it. And I appreciate that because you're right. Uh, access does not tell that whole story and uh, those are much better metrics to deal with. Um, Colleen, what would you say about availability and adoption? Yeah, I, lo I love how that's phrased. Um, when, when it was said, the first thing that came to my mind was um, restaurants and food, right? And, you know, e even depending on where you're from, um, all restaurants are accessible to anyone, right? Um, you could be homeless and the restaurant is accessible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's walk right in the door. Um, but will you really be able to afford a meal um, at Mitchell Steakhouse? No. Um, you know, will you be able to uh, adopt that food? Absolutely not. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's a, a great way to phrase it um, because it, it, it's real. And, and a lot of times people will feel good about saying this is available, right? Um, because it, it kind of, it, it's a place for you to kind of, you know, check a box to say, well, well, it's available. You know, pe people can get it if they want. And it's mm -hmm. a, it's an oversimplification. Um, you know, college is available, right? You know, uh, money is available in America, <laughs> you know, tons of money. Um, but is it, and it's accessible, someone could argue. You have a bank on your street, right? You know, it's accessible. Um, but we we also know that there's a lot more things that need to happen um, for a person to be able to truly access something and, you know, bring it into their space. So I think that's a great way to think about it. Um, even in my neighborhood near East Side Columbus, um, as, you know, we talk about Columbus Rising Project, you know, there's a lot of things here right there's a lot of infrastructure already in place um there there's a lot of access available um but excuse me but there's still people who do not have that access who cannot afford you know internet um i feel like even as a working professional for me to get high speed you know internet to be you know sustainable for myself and all of the members of my household consistently without dropping you know i, I just had to upgrade my router Right. So how many people can do that? 
right? That's a privilege to be able to say, you know what? I don't like how this is working. I'm going to go get a more expensive router, you know, but yeah, if you, if you don't have the income, then that's not an option for you. And then you're buffering and then you're dropping calls and then your websites are, are breaking out. Um, and then if you don't understand digital literacy or basic things like, you know, processing on the internet, you know, and that you can't have a thousand tabs open, you know, then, then there's so much work that needs to be done. In, in this area. So yeah, access is definitely not enough. Um, and it's definitely not even, it's not a great, a great place to begin the conversation at all. Uh, you know, it's really about how do we get people to, to adopt these things. So that's definitely terminology that I like that I'll be incorporating well, a lot more. Let me stick with this word adoption and the concept of adoption as well. Uh, and, and just to put it out there, there's not anybody in the world that I believe doesn't deserve access or, or you know, to be able to have the internet and use it, enjoy it, and be fruitful with it. Um, that's every right. place. Um, and the other thing that I'll say is that we live in a very interesting time in which there's a great deal of suspicion in society and a great deal of disinformation and misinformation about things that are important basic resources and services and what you need to have and what you should have and what you should do in order to enjoy uh, life today, right, in a community. With that, uh, coming from certain communities in uh, the Columbus area, there are a lot of people uh, who are dealing with a lot of misinformation about technology, digital, the internet, and there's a lot about security and privacy and big brother and risk and things like that, that I think some of the people who could benefit the most from some of these resources are dealing with a, a set of information that may also be holding us back. And so, you know, back to you, Kaleem, <clears throat> when we're talking about adoption, because you can't force people to to do something that you believe is good for them. Whereas a lot of people will on the one hand say, this might be bad for me. On the other hand, they might say, I don't think I need this. Like I've been dealing with my life, especially elders without the internet for a long time. They don't see telehealth coming and, and, and don't recognize that or, or, or heck voting, you know, they don't see these changes that are coming. And I may not be able to participate in many of the basic activities of daily living I'm going to be fine as long as I've got my pencil and paper. And maybe they will, but what about that adoption piece from the perspective of fear, anxiety, and misinformation? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I like the example that you use for uh, voting. I really think that the core is, is education. Um, I truly believe that digital literacy is i mean it's basically like a, a a right at this point um it's something that i feel like should be adopted in the public sphere heavily um that type of training and literacy should go through public school systems and educations and really just be a facet and an aspect of your daily existence um you know if 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 a government may have a way to make a person um get a driver's license <laughs> because mobility is that type. So I know you're about to say 60 words real fast, but you're freezing up on me just a little bit there, Colleen. So when I come in, uh, this is our case in point <laughs> of why we kind of need this, but I'm gonna put a similar question over to Angela uh, concerning that adoption and that fear. And as Colleen mentions it, we think about things like basic public health information, wash your hands, get vaccinated, uh, things, you know, sneeze into your elbow, you know, wear a mask, things that we would tell everybody. And we would not allow a significant amount of people to go through their lives unaware of basic public health knowledge. I, I kind of feel like digital and uh, broadband and internet and these kinds of things should be basic public technology knowledge. What are your reactions to that? 
Yes, I think we're starting to see that in some of the school systems. We're not seeing it in all the school systems and we definitely don't have anything for adults. So maybe some of the kids will have some of that when they're adults, but at this moment in time, what do the adults have? So we, we need a system that provides that kind of digital literacy guidance to adults whenever they need it. Mm -hmm. I think an easy way to think about it is for those of us who um, do have technology skills that allow us to go find the information that we're looking for, most of us can think about who it is we turn to for different things. Like when our Wi-Fi was having trouble, my spouse is the person who's able to deal with that. Not everybody has a spouse who can do that, right? Mm -hmm. Colleen was able to do that himself. Who is it for other people that they turn to for that support? There has to be that entity that provides that support. And in some communities that are lucky enough to have a digital inclusion program, in some places that exists. It does not exist in most places. I actually have to remind myself of that sometimes because I'm so used to working with the innovators and the folks that are doing amazing digital inclusion work that I can get this false sense of, yeah, this is happening. And I'll even catch myself. It's happening in a lot of places. No, it's not actually. It's happening in the places that I happen to be talking to. Yeah, well, this is very much the point. And uh, Kalim and I founded Rising Communities and the Columbus Rising Project specifically to provide a place and people and a program to provide much of that support uh, and basic information. I, I, I try not to say education um, because you don't wanna tell someone they're not educated, uh, but we do need an orientation and basic information. I say information resources and services for adults. Um, and that is also not a knock on people who Welcome back, Colleen. I'm just telling her about the Columbus Rising Project. <laughs> all right. It is all good. Um, that is not a knock on people or institutions that are working with children who are saying the schools need this and we're going to pour a bunch of resources in here. Recently, because of COVID and a lot of other reasons, uh, people went home from schools and we sent devices and internet access, hotspots, things like that with them. And then we started talking about, you know what, a lot of people don't have either the skills or the knowledge to use that equipment. We are going to invest significantly in providing uh, navigators or, or PCs or all sorts of stuff for a period of time for the children while we're in this crisis. So we weren't doing that before there was a COVID crisis, and we're planning on doing it until people are back in school. And then we're just not gonna do that anymore. We're not gonna- no, no, no. Doug, don't say that, don't say that. Yes, no, yes. No, no. <laughs> you're right, you're right. I, I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. We are gonna keep doing it. But- No, like that's, that's, that's a legit worry. Yeah. Right, like that's a legit worry that we have the attention now on the issue because mm -hmm. there's a pandemic. Can we keep attention on the issue? Right. And like so we, we have to figure out how to do that. Yeah. So parents and, and families who have a kid who is part of a school system, and by the way, this is typically the public school system. When in Columbus, we're talking about the Columbus public school system is going to take care of those students. They're going to do the best they can with them. But if you don't have, have a student in the public school system, if you're in the charter school system or a private school or something like that, it's not a, a universal ubiquitous kind of a resource. Actually, Central Ohio is providing it for the, the kids in the charter schools and in the other schools. Um, there has been a concerted effort that um, this being paid for through a variety of sources, including from the city and some others to pay for uh, the connectivity for the students and mm -hmm. the devices. And so it's being coordinated through the Education Service Center and the schools are being asked, how many do you need? And so it's very much through the schools. So we, I think we give credit to the leaders who've pulled that together. But at the same time, I, I feel like I have to get on my soapbox to say the kids don't live alone. Go ahead. <laughs> they, they, have, they have adults in their lives. <gasps> You're kidding me. And those adults need connectivity too and devices and they need support with, with the digital use. So... Um, 
the the COVID situation now has brought attention to the issue. We're getting devices for the kids in the short term. That's awesome. And now we need to use that to keep it going and to address all the needs in the community. I mean, elders are a particularly good example. Mm -hmm. With COVID right now, if if our if our older adults don't stay at home, they are in danger. Yeah. Right. right. So, and I ask anybody, if you didn't have internet, do you think you would stay at home as much as you do? No <laughs> way. Right. Like because that's one of the things that keeps us occupied, <laughs> so yeah. we don't go out and find other things to do. So I think this moment in time is our moment to use it to get get what we need in the short term and keep those moving forward but use the attention to come up with our long-term plans yeah my my mother is at home and she's got a steady diet of cable news and i'm i'm doing the best i can to you know can we do like four hours a day or something and it's a problem you know i don't know that the internet would be better um yeah, i actually and, think it might be better than facebook these days it probably that's the disinformation be. situation that we yeah. have but uh on the adult side also literacy is treated as it is in in just in reading not treated that way but there is a stigma and there is a level of embarrassment and we really have to have a conversation about adults and uh i think we're committed to that so your reactions Kali. um you actually have to dial back a little bit because i i jumped in in the middle of um the conversation so what what am i reacting to well, the, the idea that on an adult level, like we have thoughts and plans for dealing with children, or I really should say students, people who are currently being educated for compulsory education, yeah. we're making sure they have a device and some digital literacy and capabilities and access to the internet. And I'll use the word access there because a lot of them are not using the internet. So um, right. they do have adoption. Um, and, and in some, cases, we have a hodgepodge of, of different uh, uh, programs and resources for elders or, or, or even adults, but we have not approached it that really, particularly for communities that are on the wrong side of a divide, yeah. uh, tickling around at the edges is not going to get the job done. We need a major educational resource push uh, for everybody. So when I say yeah. uh, everybody and adults, I really believe that we need a comprehensive generational community kind of a thing. So we don't yeah. want to leave kids out because they got it at school, right? No. So, you know what I mean? We don't want to just focus on adults. We want to focus on everybody, but we've got a problem in the middle there, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you don't, um, past things I've done, like I said, I mentioned, I did a lot of work in youth and youth advocacy, violence prevention, um, intervention work. And, one of the first things I noticed, uh, and this was prior to me entering tech, and one of the first things I noticed was that your youth are really more of a barometer for a neighborhood or a community, right? They are not necessarily the the, the thing that if you change them, you change the everything around them. No, um, it's quite opposite. Actually, they are usually the least empowered person in the individual. They can't do in, in the community. They can't mm -hmm. do anything legally. Uh, they don't have any control over most aspects of their destiny. Uh, you know, so uh, essentially they are the lowest on the hierarchy, you know, they are basically the most vulnerable, uh, because that, and that's, that's a reason why we need to get them things because they're vulnerable and the children need things. Right. But when we're talking about changing things, you have to attack the, the places of influence and power. And I'll give you an, uh, a great example of that. Okay. You bought your Chromebook home and you're like, I'm ready to do work somebody in your house says, no, I, I mean, do your work later. I'm going to, you know, do something else on this computer because it's a device. Mm -hmm. And the kid can't do anything about that, <laughs> you know, like, um, and there's literally nothing they could do about it. And there's nobody would even know if that scenario was happening. Um, so I think you have to really address it at a, at a, um, at a familiar level, you know, uh, we get this idea sometimes that, you know, people exist in silos, right? Like you have youth or senior or adults. And it's like, these people are all in the same household, right? You know, it's not like um, everybody in a certain demographic lives in a different house on the block, right? right. It's, a, it's a mashup and it's how those things work. 
uh, my example, we have small children at our home, right? So the way we're managing devices, you know, across my wife and I doing work and our children doing work, we're both in the same house, right? So who has access to devices? Who's streaming what? I'm like, hey, I'm on this call. Everybody switch to the, the 5G signal. Right. Free up my frequency on on this one, you know, get off that Netflix. I'm, I'm trying to do a panel right now. You know, I don't want to keep dropping. Um, I'm pretty sure I just dropped because the boys was in there playing Xbox. I'm pretty sure because they were streaming some stuff. But um, yeah, so all of these things exist like together. And I think we have to kind of address them together as much as possible. And you have to kind of change the culture. Um, I think that changing the culture and, and households also revolves around like, what is it that people can do once they have adopted technology, right? Uh, I can give you a device, but the library is the case and study for that, right? I see youth go after school, they go to the library and guess what they don't do? Anything productive. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they're on the computers, but they're not doing anything productive to move their situation forward. That's an education piece. Um, that is letting you know that, hey, do you realize with this device, you have um, thousands of years of power in your pocket? You know, mm -hmm. you know you, you're in poverty right now. Do you realize that this can actually help alleviate that? But if your introduction to the technology was just only entertainment, right? You know, we all need entertainment, but if it's if you only look at your computer as entertainment, or you only look at internet as you know a way to uh, message somebody, then you you miss ninety nine percent and you miss the power in it, and then we're right back in the same situation. Right. So which I is, think it's which that is not kind to of say that, that you shouldn't enjoy the entertainment that's kind of there. Yeah. Uh, but I think you and I had a conversation about you know a lot of people can use a web page, they can use a web browser, but when you get to the College Common app. Uh, you're going to get stuck uh, because it's confusing. And, and, you know, when you have to do a FAFSA application, that's a barrier to college. And exactly. it's, not, it's not just learning how to use the internet is not going to help you navigate a complex and confusing website. And you may then turn away from it. And so those kinds of tutors and mentors and just a whole community moving in another direction, exactly. I think is going to be uh, critical. So I, there's a whole bunch of things that we need three of these panels, but I, I want to get in another direction to make sure that that we just sort of ask another thing here. And Angela, I'm interested in your uh, thoughts on this. Many companies have, I'll use the phrase, stepped up, put resources out there, whether it be computers, hotspots, internet access, cash money, just a lot of things. And I look at at some of these companies that are putting these things up and say, they're doing what they have and doing what they know how to do. And that's okay. You know, uh, people who were making clothing started making masks. You know what I mean? They didn't start making uh, vaccines. <laughs> it's like, well, we don't do that, but we can make masks. So I'm wondering what you see as the best kinds of relationships and partnerships with carriers, technology companies, people who have said, hey, I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of stuff. They don't say, this is how you use it or, or I'll help with that. But they do, they, they've come up with some things. So what are your thoughts on that? The internet service providers in particular have, they already had discount offers. And during this time, some of them have some good, uh, what we've been calling single payer agreements. Comcast calls them uh, sponsored agreements where somebody writes a check, right? So there's one entity that pays for multiple accounts like for students accounts, uh, such as is going through the Educational Service Center in Central Ohio. And it's, it, that's valuable, that kind of arrangement. There's also, but it's not, it's not, it's a, it's a temporary solution, right? Who's gonna be able to continue to pay for those even at a discount long-term? I really, I've looked at this a hundred different ways. I don't see any other route than the federal government has got to get involved in paying for people's internet. Until we have cheaper internet, I mean like seriously cheaper internet, not mildly cheaper internet, 
the federal government is going to have to get involved in that. The other companies that are helping out now, they are donating money. They are, you know, discounting their services. The probably one of the most creative solutions I saw, because there's a there's a problem out not having enough devices out there. Like, go try to buy a bunch of Chromebooks. Yeah, let me know how that goes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You just can't get them the way you used to be able to get them before. So there's more refurbishing going on. And so one of the examples from Cleveland, Ohio, is that they have companies there buying out their own computer leases and then getting the computers that they were going to send out to who knows where, but getting those into a local refurbisher in order to then get those devices into homes. Mm -hmm. So that's some creative thinking right there. And I think the more of that kind of creative thinking, the better. And the way that creative thinking came about is because those companies were in, are involved in a digital equity coalition in Cleveland, in the greater Cleveland area. So if we can have more of those of the companies who recognize that this is an issue involved in those coalitions, in the discussions, then they're going to come up with a solution. And maybe it has to do with their staff volunteering as tech support. We're seeing that too, right? So we're seeing these creative ways to help that may not necessarily be about writing a check. Although I do not want to discourage anyone from writing a check. Yeah, I'm there with you. I applaud the motivation that caused them to say, hey, we've got computers, we can do something, we have money, you know, we're not talking about a lot of money even, I mean, on a mass scale maybe, and I agree with you on the federal government thing, it doesn't even have to be cash, you know, there's a lot of different ways to spread that resource out there. Um, we're running up on time now, uh, but I, I want to put one other interesting concept out here and see what you guys think about it. I don't think that every community is the same, and, and the internet may be like a common, it's a commodity and it kind of acts the same everywhere, but communities interact with technology and digital resources differently based on the kind of community they kind of are. And I think there's different models that are going to work for different communities. I think we have some sameness, but I wonder, I, the word self-determination have come up in, in, in my head in thinking about maybe one of the reasons why we're not achieving universal adoption is, first of all, we don't have universal access and availability, but second of all, we're different and we should treat this stuff differently and maybe uh, encouraging communities to take the lead on how they would like to be served as opposed to a blanket common way around that. Am I somewhere close to the mark on that? Colleen, you first and then Angela. Yeah, I think that every community has its its own culture, its own flavor, um, its own needs, and and that becomes you know again going back to transportation. Uh, if you're in New York, subway. Yes, you know if you're in Columbus, you may not need a subway, um, but you do need a mode of transportation. And you say yes, we do. I would love it personally. I personally. <laughs> We'll get there. Yes, I personally would love Internet it. first, mobility. Yeah, yeah. We are the largest US city that doesn't have a yeah. master system. A million so. people, it's gotta happen. This is true, this is true. Um, so, you know, but people seem to be content with their scooters, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I think, I think you have to focus on, you know, like the concept, right? Um, the paradigm and, the, and the, the greater backdrop is in that example is mobility, right? Mm -hmm. So it's people have to always ask, even if you want to stay at home, entire communities need to be, you know, mobile to access resources and et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's the same thing with digitally. Will, will it look the same? Will everybody have, uh, you know, public Wi-Fi and different things like that? Possibly not. I can't imagine that working in every single you know, community that has this issue, but we know that uh, you need it. It needs to be there. How much you want to use it, that's on you. How, you know, do you, do you need, you know, 10 petabytes every second? I mean, that that would depend on, you know, the, the needs of, of that community. So I, I'm a firm believer in, uh, you know, people controlling their own narrative and people, you know, being able to come together to say, this is what we want and this is how we want it. After, of course, receiving the information because sometimes people don't know what they want. 
because yeah. they don't really know what's available. They don't know what's possible. Right. Um, so I think there has to be that first piece of let me show you the possibilities or even ways that this could, you know, enhance your your existence and then ultimately working together um, right. to find those solutions. So, uh, yeah, and, and that's no knock on universality or anything like that, but an educated community, a community that is aware is going to be able to direct their own, uh, uh, you know, future in that way. Uh, Angela, last words? So I'm going to kind of put a little twist on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do want communities to make their own choices, but also the limitations that have been put on what those choices are have happened from outside um, that, yeah. right? So like that's, that's a challenge. So the country could set goals where we want everyone to have certain speeds at certain costs mm -hmm. and then the communities can get there the way they want to get there but we do need the federal government to provide that that financial support to to get there and i think we also the i think kaleem's part about the knowing what's possible is a huge issue how many folks can tell you the difference between uh dsl and cable and fiber Right. or even a cellular service versus a wireline service. That kind of awareness of what is out there. And then they would know to get upset that couple blocks down, there's fiber available. Mm -hmm. Kaleem, is there fiber available in your neighborhood? There is. Is there fiber a couple streets over? I don't know. I have, a, I, have a, I have an estimate on where you live and I'm going to say no. Yeah. It's oh, not, oh, a couple not. of streets over. Oh, ab yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. In, in my because, yeah, there, there's some places that have it. And yeah, a couple of streets there are over. Some places that don't. Definitely. Why, definitely why is not. It, why is yeah. it that some of those places don't? Yeah. Do those places that don't have really high incomes, Khalid? Yeah. No. <laughs> right? They got skipped because they're poor. Yeah, exactly. That is not okay that we skip we the providers did not lay fiber in the poorer neighborhoods it occurs in central ohio it occurs in lots of other cities it occurs in rural areas yeah. right it occurs all over because the return isn't great enough right so that's where that knowing what to ask for is important like we got to know to be mad if we don't know that that's happening we don't know to be like this is not okay <laughs> Yeah, I, I would throw in there knowing how to ask as well. And advocacy is something yeah. that, I mean, some of us don't even vote. So, you know, we don't have sidewalks because we don't vote. And, and we don't have a lot of things because we don't know how to organize around that particular resource that, that goes across the board. So um, this is a fascinating conversation that could go on. Uh, and, and I hope it does. And uh, perhaps some of it will go on at this conference. But uh, Angela Seifer and Kaleem Musa, I want to thank both of you for this invigorating and energetic conversation uh, around more than just the infrastructure, but the people side, the, the issues yeah. side of why we're not accomplishing uh, access, availability, and adoption, as, as well as a number of other things. So thank you both. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mountain Connect. Uh, this is wonderful. And uh, thanks everyone for attending our, our session. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Kaleem. Thank thanks, Doug. Thank you, Angela.